Hi, everyone. This is Terry Taylor, and we're getting ready to get started in one second. Uh, Ms. Jacqueline Bullock, our education director, is going to um, give you a welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. As Terry shared, my name is Jacqueline Bullock. I am the Director of Education and Visitor Services at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. We are so very excited uh, to bring this virtual lecture to you. Um, and I am even more excited to introduce uh, Richard Bell to you. Um, Professor Bell is a professor of history at the University of Maryland, um, as well as a research fellow at Yale, or had a research fellowship at Yale, Cambridge, and the Library of Congress. Um, he is a recipient of the National Endowment of Humanities Public Scholar Award, um, and he also serves as a trustee of the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, and in addition, as an elected member of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Um, we're so excited to come together today to talk about his new book, uh, Stolen, Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery in Odyssey Home, uh, which is uh, critically acclaimed and has been shortlisted for both the George Washington and Harriet Tubman Prize. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Professor Bell, uh, we are excited to hear about your work. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline. Thank you to Terry as well for the behind the scenes wizardry that makes this sort of event um, possible. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, albeit virtually. Uh, I live in PG County, Prince George's County. I teach at the University of Maryland uh, College Park, uh, and I've been to the Lewis uh, many times. Uh, um, I hope to get back there again very soon indeed. So this will be uh, a useful second best. Uh, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to talk about this new scholarship, uh, which is um, uh, encapsulated in this new book, uh, Stolen, which Jacqueline introduced. And the way we're going to do this tonight, I think, um, is I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes uh, about this book and its themes and why it matters. Um, and at any point in this 30 minutes, if you have a question, there's a question tab somewhere um, on your screen that you can use to pose um, a question, and then with Terry or Jacqueline's help, when I'm done in about 30 minutes, we'll try to uh, sift through some of those questions so we can have um, a conversation in the time we have uh, left. So uh, let us dive in, and this, of course, obviously is sobering uh, stuff, because Cornelius Sinclair was 10 years old, and he was trapped. He was stuck. He was locked in the belly of a small ship that looked a lot like uh, this one, a small ship that was bobbing in the middle of the Delaware River, a mile south of Philadelphia. A man had grabbed Cornelius from a spot near Philadelphia's market an hour ago, had shoved a black gag across this kid's mouth, tossed him into a wagon, and hauled him aboard this ship. It was dark below the little vessel's waterline, but Cornelius could see enough to know that he was not the only child locked down there. Four pairs of eyes stared right back at him. Four other black boys. One looked about his size. He was probably 10 or 11, like Cornelius. Two more were taller, perhaps 15, 16 years old. The last of them was shorter and smaller than everyone else, and he might have been as young as eight years old. Yesterday, all five boys had been free, like you and me. But now, suddenly, they were slaves prisoners of a gang of child snatchers who plan to sell their lives and their labor, most likely to plantation owners in the deep, deep South. If their abductors got away with this, Cornelius would spend the rest of his life as someone else's property somewhere very far away. He would probably never see his family again. Cornelius disappeared in late August, 1825 one of dozens of free African-American children to vanish in similar circumstances from Philadelphia that single year alone. In the early 1800s, Philadelphia was the hub of American slavery's blackest market. Philadelphia's gridded streets, its tangled alleys, were hunting grounds for crews of professional kidnappers who made their livings turning free black kids like Cornelius into Southern slaves. 
those kidnappers did their work swiftly and shamelessly. In brazen affront to Philadelphia's reputation as not only the city of brotherly love, but also a safe haven for people of color and the headquarters of America's anti-slavery movement. But of course, to kidnappers, to criminals, none of that stuff mattered. And in truth, early 19th century Philadelphia was probably one of the most dangerous places to be free and black anywhere in the United States. And that was a product of its location. It was the nearest major free city to the slave south. Philadelphia was just 40 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line, the boundary that separated Pennsylvania from several slave states to its south. And as Pennsylvania and other northern states had slowly disentangled themselves from race slavery in the 50 or so years after the American Revolution, that boundary running along Pennsylvania's southern border become ever more important, especially for African Americans. By 1825, the year that Cornelius was kidnapped, the Mason-Dixon line seemed to divide two worlds, separating northern free states from many southern slave states. And Philadelphia's proximity to that frontier line made its many free black residents attractive targets for professional people snatchers. They preyed on the members of Philadelphia's free black community relentlessly, putting bullseyes on their backs and putting prices on their heads. And the people they stole away could fetch anywhere up to $15,000 per person in today's money in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, three of the new territories and states that were rising up along the Gulf Coast at exactly this time. The American settlers swarming into that region demanded a nearly bottomless supply of forced labor to cut sugarcane and pick cotton. Buying some of their enslaved laborers from kidnappers of free people was not likely the slave owners planters first choice, but their options were limited. Planters down there in the deep south had been forced to look to American sources, domestic sources, for their manpower needs. Ever since the year 1808, the year that lawmakers in Washington, D.C. had passed legislation outlawing any further imports of black people from Africa or the Caribbean for the purposes of enslaving them in America. That 1808 decision, it may not be very famous, but it was very important. It was a major turning point in the history of slavery in America, a turning point that spurred the growth of an American internal domestic slave trade within the United States. After that 1808 decision, interstate slave traders here in the United States tried to satisfy those Southwestern settlers' demands for black labor by bringing them thousands of American born enslaved people each year from existing slave states like Virginia and our own state, Maryland. But settlers down in the Deep South wanted even more. And the more demand they, what there was and the more they were willing to pay, the more tempting and profitable it became for anyone sufficiently cold-blooded to try to kidnap free children like Cornelius from northern cities like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, smuggle them into that legal supply chain, and then sell them in that vast new southwestern slave market. Those economic incentives left Philadelphia's large and dynamic free black community dangerously exposed. By 1825, the city of brotherly love had become the center of an interstate kidnapping operation. It had become a northern terminus of something that I call America's reverse underground railroad. So that is what I've just described. America's reverse underground railroad is the kidnapping and trafficking into slavery of free black people from within the United States. And this reverse underground railroad, and it's much better known namesake, the underground railroad, they of course ran in opposite directions and existed for completely different purposes. 
But because they're opposites, they're also in some ways mirror images of one another. On the Underground Railroad, the good one, the famous one, the Harriet Tubman one, enslaved people abandoned southern plantations and trekked usually northwards, dreaming of new lives, new opportunities in freedom. On America's reverse Underground Railroad, free black people vanished from northern cities like Philadelphia and were made to trudge southward to be sold into plantation slavery. On the Underground Railroad, conductors like Harriet Tubman risked their lives and their own liberty, of course, to help black fugitives make these epic journeys of freedom. While on America's reverse Underground Railroad, the conductors were kidnappers and human traffickers motivated by money. These two networks, one good and courageous, the other, I think, monstrous and evil, roared to life at the same time in the early 1800s to exploit what by then had become major differences in the legal status of slavery in the North versus the South. Both of these networks were loosely organized, highly opportunistic. Both ran on secrecy and relied on small circles of trusted participants, on forged documents, false identities, disguise. The direction of travel was usually completely different but the routes, the roads taken by freedom seekers and by victims of kidnapping like 10-year-old Cornelius Sinclair were often largely the same and they might even have passed one another on certain roads from time to time. And what's more, the volume of traffic, the number of people on these two railroads was, believe me, roughly the same. Each one carried hundreds of black adults and children across state lines each year, some of them moving out of slavery, others being sucked into it. Most Americans, and many Marylanders in particular, I think, know quite a lot about the Underground Railroad. Historians have, after all, spent decades studying the strategies and the tactics that Harriet Tubman and her fellow conductors and station agents used to help freedom seekers escape from slavery. Finally, those heroes of American history are commanding center stage. They're in our popular culture. There are now underground railroad walking tours, television shows, museums, the Lewis, but also this big one in Cincinnati, and of course the National Park Service uh, site in Cambridge, Maryland. There's also this new movie dedicated to Harriet Tubman, which tells her story. Um, that movie is not a perfect movie. Um, as a historian, I give it sort of a B, but I'm really glad it exists because it does shine a spotlight for people who aren't historians on this amazing American's life, this amazing Marylander's life. So we know quite a lot about the Underground Railroad. We know far less about America's reverse Underground Railroad. Its conductors and station agents worked tirelessly to remain untouchable and the identities of all but a handful of these criminals still remain a secret, even today. They certainly never went on public lectures advertising their work. They never went on fundraising tours. Only rarely do their names and crimes even appear in surviving police files or trial transcripts. That low profile, the result of the years they spent in the shadows, protected by bribes, corruption, and a staggering amount of civilian indifference to the atrocities they were committing. Unlike legal interstate slave traders who sometimes left their papers to Southern colleges and historical societies, the outlaws who built America's reverse underground railroad left no business records, no bundles of private letters for historians to read and examine in the Library of Congress. They did not write memoirs about their careers. They did not pose for paintings or photographs, leaving journalists and activists of the era to just guess, as you see here, at what they might have looked like. But as I argue in my new book, Stolen, these professional kidnappers nonetheless left their mark everywhere on 19th century America. If we think not just about Philadelphia, where this true story in Stolen begins, but about every 
um, part of the United States, especially the North, where there's a free black community. If we think not just about 1825, when this true story in Stolen begins, but about, but about each and every year before the Civil War, we can say, sadly, that these kidnappers stole away likely tens of thousands of free black people, many of them children, like Cornelius, under the age of 16. Most of those they kidnapped could not read or write and were never heard from again. Their families and friends would, of course, search for them, advertise, petition, wait in earnest for news, but usually no news came. Free black people in northern cities like Philadelphia had few white allies at this time in American history, beyond the meager ranks of a few Quaker-led anti-slavery societies. What's more, white employers openly discriminated against African-American job applicants. White policemen, city constables, generally ignored people of color's complaints and usually turned a blind eye to most white on black street violence. So when children like Cornelius went missing, their parents could hardly ever persuade mayors or magistrates to get involved, to do something. It was rarer still for anyone to be able to gather enough evidence to issue arrest warrants, search property, and interrogate suspects. And even then, experienced members of these many different kidnapping crews knew exactly what to do, exactly what to say, to talk their way out of trouble and get back to work. I'm betting all of you here tonight have heard of 12 Years a Slave. This, of course, was the name of a movie about, what, seven or eight years ago that won the Best Picture Oscar. And many of you may know it's based on a true story and on a memoir um, written by a man called Solomon Northup, who, of course, was one of the thousands of victims of America's reverse underground railroad, a free person sucked into slavery. Unlike almost anyone else, he later escaped from that slavery, though it took him 12 years to do it. And when he did, he returned home and he wrote about it all. And in that memoir, 12 Years a Slave, which he wrote in 1853, Northup explains what riding America's reverse underground railroad was like for him. He explains how a pair of well-dressed white con men lured him into New York City from his home in upstate New York in 1841. And at the time, Northup was um, prosperous, employed, literate, and in his mid-30s. In Manhattan, these two well-dressed white con men wined him, dined him, and drugged him. And then they sold him as a slave to an interstate slave trader in Washington, D.C. Northup was forced onto a slave ship bound for New Orleans. And there he was sold in one of that city's infamous slave showrooms to a planter who then put him to work in his sugarcane fields. In 2013, that Oscar-winning film based on Northup's extraordinary autobiography drew overdue attention to his ordeal. And I think that movie is important and astonishing and every American should see it. But both the memoir and the movie nonetheless offer distorted, narrow, maybe even misleading views of who the agents of America's reverse underground railroad usually targeted and how they normally made their money. It turns out, folks, that Northup's experiences were not at all typical of everyone else's. For instance, these kidnappers rarely approached highly literate, middle-aged men like Northup, no. These kidnappers preferred instead to lure away poorly educated street kids with ruses that could swiftly separate them from their families. Very few of their captives traveled by ship to New Orleans either. Instead, kidnappers forced most boys and girls to trek southward on foot in small specialized overland convoys known as coffles after the Arabic word for caravan. And their prisoners rarely ended up in showrooms or on the auction block either. Their prisoners were vastly more likely to be sold off along the way 
in ones or twos in furtive all cash deals to hard up planters in Mississippi and the Alabama interior who wanted to buy more human beings but were too cheap to pay big city New Orleans prices. That was what was typical on America's reverse underground railroad. And all of that is almost exactly what happened to Cornelius Sinclair, the 10 year old boy who's one of the five central figures in my book Stolen. In August of 1825, Cornelius, Enos, Alex, Sam, and Joe, five boys living in Philadelphia, fell into the hands of 19th century America's most fearsome gang of kidnappers. Those captors hustled them onto that little ship just outside Philadelphia, which is in the top right hand corner of this slide. Then they warehoused them for a couple of weeks um, down on the Delmarva Peninsula, right on the state line between Delaware and Maryland. If you can see a black dot above the word Nanticote, then you can see the location of that safe house. And then their kidnappers marched them onwards, halfway across this vast continent towards the deep south where they tried to sell these five free children as slaves. This is obviously a monstrous journey, a soul destroying journey. On foot, it's a journey of two million children's footsteps. I have a lot to say about it in my book, which I'll spare you here tonight. And for the interests of time, and because I hope some of you will read the book, I'll also be perhaps a bit coy and mysterious about the last three words of the book's subtitle and their astonishing odyssey home. Because I can tell you that some, though not all, of these five boys will survive this ordeal, escape this ordeal, free themselves, and return to freedom. I'm not going to tell you how they did it because I hope you take a look, but what I will tell you now is that it was genuinely astonishing. As they worked to make it happen, and as I followed them on that story, it was astonishing. It would involve, over the next few years, uh, two murders, three exhumations of dead bodies, an escape, a recapture, a suicide, a race riot, a lawsuit, the nation's first most wanted list, and America's largest manhunt so far. Instead of spilling all the beans here, let me just quickly note that the full story of what did happen next to Cornelius Sinclair and Enos and Alex and Sam and Joe, the five boys who went missing from Philadelphia in 1825, has never before been fully told. And for understandable reasons. Cornelius was a child at the time. He came from a hard up family that was not the sort to leave behind many traces in libraries and archives. And that's a problem, right? Because this is not a novel. This is not fiction. This is history, a true story. And historians need evidence. We need sources, lots of them, to reconstruct past lives in ways that are fair and true. The stories and struggles of the many Americans who do not leave behind them, rich troves of papers, diaries, and memoirs, often remain unstudied as a result of the lack of readily available evidence. So to reconstruct the outline of Cornelius's journey along America's reverse Underground Railroad, I began by wringing what I could from a small packet of letters written to or from the mayor of Philadelphia, who belatedly wades into this story. And from coverage of Cornelius's case in a single anti-slavery magazine. To be clear, folks, historians have known about these two modest sources for some time, but on their own, they turn out to be too thin and few to sustain a whole book length reconstruction of this astonishing case, which does not end up the way most cases like this begin. So I've had to go looking elsewhere, digging around in any archive, any library I could think of for scraps of information that when put together could help flesh this all out. There has been a lot of days in the archives spent finding nothing, um, looking for needles in haystacks and finding only hay. But if you keep looking, folks, you do find those needles. Ultimately, it's certainly been worth it. 
over more than six years of research for this project, I've unearthed several treasures, more than 100 new sources about this case, buried within 35 archives in 14 states and the District of Columbia. Among those new sources, I, I discovered the handwritten notes of a trial that took place down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a trial which would decide the fate of one of these five boys, the fate of Cornelius, actually, for the rest of his life. Would he be forever enslaved or forever free? It was up to a white judge in Tuscaloosa to decide. I came across something I thought I would never find. I came across a pair of letters authored by one of the kidnappers in which he names all his accomplices, describes their role in these boys' abduction, and then minimizes his own responsibility as if he had nothing to do with it. And I came across something else which has stuck with me even more than these other sources. What I'm referring to is something I found in a Philadelphia newspaper that was put there about three days after Cornelius disappeared by his dad, Joseph. As you can probably guess from that description, it's a missing persons ad. It's short so I can read it to you. It says, boy lost. The subscriber's son, Cornelius Sinclair, a colored boy, about 11 years old, left his friends yesterday. And as he had no cause and had never before absented himself, I fear he's been seduced away by some evil-minded person. My son is a very dark-skinned, mixed-race lad. He's pretty stout-built. He's got thin, long fingers, but his eyes aren't good, and his left eye is smaller than his right. Any person hearing of our son will confer a favor on his afflicted parents by giving information to my employer at this address, Joseph Sinclair. Folks, every time I read this Boy Lost ad, and I've read this thing hundreds and hundreds of times, the same two words jump out at me, like they're written in neon, like they're written 60 foot high. Afflicted parents. All of us are children of parents. Many of us are parents of children, grandchildren. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old who are being very noisy in the next room. The thought that my children could ever be ripped away from me, and that as their dad, there's nothing I could do to stop that except put an ad in a newspaper and hope for the best. That just rips at me in a really basic, primal way. Afflicted parents. Before I seek your questions, and I hope you have some, don't be afraid. Put anything you want in the question box. We'll, take, we'll tackle it. Let me wrap up with a couple of brief reflections about why I think learning about America's reverse Underground Railroad is important and why Cornelius Sinclair's particular experience as a rider on that railroad is worth your time. To begin with, I would argue forcefully that black lives have always mattered. And thus any story about free African-American children being ripped from their families, swallowed up by slavery, is a story worth telling for its own damning sake. But the remarkable ordeal that Cornelius and his four fellow captives endured also demands our attention, I think, for many other reasons. For one thing, it serves as a pointed reminder that in northern towns and cities before the Civil War, child snatching was heartbreakingly frequent and black freedom was achingly fragile. It demonstrates, too, the important role that this grotesque trade in kidnapped free people played in accelerating the spread of American slavery into the Deep South over the same period. Now, as I said, I'm not going to tell you everything that happens in the second half of this book, which is much sunnier and happier than the first half. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened to Cornelius after he was kidnapped and trafficked into Alabama. But I will drop some big hints now. And I will say that the dogged efforts of all those involved in trying to save him and Sam and Enos and Alex and Joe 
from the horrors of slavery in the Southwest would have profound consequences. The rescue efforts of parents and allies and the aftermath of their campaign would radicalize black communities across the free states and embolden African-Americans to embrace violence in the necessary cause of self-defense and mutual protection as almost never before in American history. Their efforts would also reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well by encouraging anti-slavery writers with access to a printing press like the two uh, white women who wrote this children's anti-slavery alphabet to try to focus the northern reading public's attention on the sufferings of black families being forcibly separated by kidnappers, slave catchers, slave traders, by slavery itself. But most immediately, outrage over the abduction of these five boys would force lawmakers in Pennsylvania to pass a tough new anti-kidnapping measure known as a personal liberty law. And Pennsylvania's 1826 personal liberty law would enrage Southerners and slaveholders, more so than any other state law passed before the Civil War. And it set in motion a chain of court challenges against it, political retaliations against it, that culminated in the passage through Congress in Washington of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a pro-slavery abomination of a law that put this country on a collision course with civil war. To conclude, Cornelius Sinclair's experience as a rider on America's reverse Underground Railroad was the result of the confluence of massive economic and political forces. And what happened to him and the things he and the other boys made happen next would, as I've just suggested, usher in a new chapter in the history of slavery and freedom in the United States. But that lasting legacy must never be allowed to obscure the urgent stakes of his particular story. A 10-year-old boy and four other free children were dragged into slavery in 1825. They would have to fight like hell to try to escape. Thanks very much. Because book signings are now impossible in person in the Lewis because of COVID, with the permission of the Lewis, I put up uh, some details about the book, the different formats that it's available in, hardcover, paperback, Kindle, Audible audiobook, old fashioned CD audiobook. And if anyone out there is interested in a signed copy of the paperback, uh, you can just contact me at my email address to arrange that transaction. Uh, my email address is on the screen at the bottom. It's rjbell -L at umd.edu. And so with that, I'm going to take a breath and uh, try and hand back to Jacqueline or Terry to see where we stand. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dr. Bell. Uh, that was really a good presentation there. Um, we're going to give a couple of minutes, I guess, for people to type up any questions or comments they have. We do have one, though, from Ms. Willa Banks. Um, she wants to know um, more about your research and how did you uncover the information about the voice? Yeah. Um... I stumbled across this uh, story, Miss Willibald. Um, I was not looking for it. It found me. Uh, I was working on a different project 10 years ago. It was about suicide uh, between the revolution and the civil war. I'm clearly drawn to very dark topics and my wife thinks my next topic should be something happier like kittens in American history. Um, but I was working on a project about suicide and I came across the alleged suicide of a white woman in her 60s who was in jail in Delaware in 1829, so four years after the events in this book. And in jail in Delaware, awaiting trial for murder, she died. And people at the time thought she may have committed suicide. So I began looking into the circumstances of her death. And I became aware of who she was and of the circumstances of her life. Her name was Patty Cannon, 
And in her life, for the past 20 years, she had been the co-leader of the most active, effective, and well-known gang of kidnappers of free African-American children and adults anywhere in the United States. She'd inherited that family business from her dead husband, and she ran it with her son-in-law for the best part of 20 years. And that gang was responsible for the abduction of hundreds of free people, many of them children, many of them from Baltimore and from Philadelphia and other places, including the Eastern Shore itself. When I discovered this, I had never heard of Patty Cannon, and I had not assumed that gangs like hers existed or had done such terrible damage to free black communities. So as I began digging into the circumstances of her life, I became aware of the existence of her gang and many other gangs like it all across the northern towns uh, and states. Um, and so I figured that if I didn't know this, and I'd been a practicing historian then for 15 years, if I didn't know how common the kidnapping and trafficking into slavery of free black people was, then maybe other people didn't know this either. So I set about to write a book to um, educate myself about this phenomenon, which I called America's Reverse Underground Railroad, um, and also to share my findings with as many people as possible. Uh, and as you can see, I've zeroed in on one particular story, which is better evidenced and better documented and has a happier ending than most other stories like it as a way to shine a spotlight, not just on that case, but on all the other cases that began the same way with the disappearance of a loved one, a parent, a child from, a free black community somewhere in the United States. I um, uh, believe Bernice wanted to piggyback on that and wanted to know um, how were you sustained to stick with it for six years? Yeah, geez, I don't know. Um, that's a hard one, Bernice, right? Now, I should say on the, on the front end, you know, historians um, work slowly and carefully, we don't work fast. Um, I hope that means we work, uh, you know, as I said, carefully and meticulously. So I'm used to being patient and for his good history to take time. Um, but this is obviously a very dark subject. Uh, the general theme of child snatching, of kidnapping, of attacks on the legal freedom of legally free African-American people. That is a difficult um, topic. And to be honest, I had to pivot midway through this project to get myself through it psychologically. So I told you that I came across the story through one of the kidnappers, this woman, Patty Cannon, who runs the gang, whose operatives will steal Cornelius, Sam, Enos, Alex, and Joe from Philly in 1825. And I originally conceived this project as a biography of the life and career of this monstrous white woman, Patty Cannon. Two years into that project, I hated her so much I could barely go on. And so I pivoted. Um, I pivoted to the story of these boys um, and their journey through Patty Cannon's America, their journey along America's reverse underground railroad. And I put them front and center. I made them my protagonists, my central actors. It's them, the boys, that appear in almost every paragraph in this book. Patty Cannon appears too, but she is not the main character. She is not the focus of my attention. I want to know what this experience was like for these boys um, and how they survived it, those who did how they liberated themselves, those who did, and how it shaped them for those who survived to tell the tale, which some of them um, did. Um, folks who read this book, I think, will be amazed by just how resilient, brave, courageous, resourceful these young children are. The oldest, Sam, is 16 years old. The youngest, uh, Alex, is eight years old. Uh, they kept me going uh, in this dark story, and I wanted to share that story with other people who I thought would have the same reaction. Okay. Um, Wanda says, this is not the first time I've heard about free blacks being stolen and taken into slavery, but had no idea that this had happened to children. Yeah. Yeah, so I feel the same way, Wanda. So the only case that I was aware of before I started this project was Solomon Northup's story, which is told in his memoir, 12 Years a Slave. And when I started this project, it was 2011, the movie, had not come out yet. It had not won the Academy Award. It was not front and center in everyone's mind. And I think the movie's actually been really useful because for everyone who's seen it, which is a lot of people, um, it's at least told them that this was a thing that could happen. The kidnapping of a legally free person, uh, in this case, an adult named Solomon Northup, 
So um, once people have seen the movie, I think the idea that this was happening to many other adults and not just to adults, but also to children, um, makes a lot more sense, gruesome sense, but sense um, nevertheless. And it's a reminder that um, even though there was great demand in the Deep South for um, adult men who they could put uh, cutting sugarcane, which is what Northup does, which is backbreaking work for adults, there was equal demand, equally robust demand for younger people, for children, 13, 14, 15 years old, who could pick cotton. Um, to pick cotton, you don't need massive amounts of physical brute strength. What you need is stamina and you need physical dexterity. And teenagers, girls and boys, possess those things in abundance. You may remember in 12 Years a Slave, um, the character of Patsy, who was a real person, uh, was played by Lupita Nyong'o uh, in the movie. Uh, she was the most valuable enslaved person on that plantation. And she's a, you know, a wiry, flimsy young girl. The real Patsy was 13 years old when she arrived on that plantation. So demand for children is actually remarkably strong, enduring, and robust. And these kidnappers take advantage of that and try to supply that demand with some illegally kidnapped free children too. Um, Jane says, horrifying story. Did Baltimore play a role in the reverse railroad as it did in the Underground Railroad to Freedom? Yeah, Baltimore plays a role in everything of importance uh, in 19th century America. Baltimore goes from being a pretty small, sleepy place in the 1770s, uh, but fast forward just 50 years, and it is the second largest, in, second, second largest city in America in the 1820s, has 60,000 people in it, explosive population growth. And because of its location, um, halfway between, you know, um, Massachusetts and Mississippi, let's say, because it's a port city, because it's on the Chesapeake Bay, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a nexus, uh, an entrepot, uh, a meeting place, a center for almost any trade you care to name. That could be the trade of tobacco um, for sale in Europe, um, it could be ship construction, it could be whatever it might be, it could be wheat processing, um, but it's also um, a major um, center for uh, two types of slave trading that I'm gonna mention. Um, one is legal slave trading, so um, people who own slaves out on the Eastern Shore or in Howard County or in Baltimore County who want to sell some of their slaves to a slave trader might go to Baltimore to do that, that legal slave trader will then carry them across the country, jack up the price and resell that same individual to someone setting up a plantation in Mississippi. Um, that's the legal slave trade. It's also called the domestic slave trade and it's big business. And Baltimore, um, Alexandria and Georgetown are three of the most important hubs in our region for the legal slave trade. We can document the location of, I think, somewhere between 10 and 15 legal slave traders premises premises in downtown Baltimore, Indiana Harbor, Pratt Street, etc. But there's also America's reverse underground railroad, the kidnapping of free black people. In my remarks today, I focused on the case in Philadelphia that my book is focused on. But there are hundreds and thousands of cases like this, and not all of them begin in the free states. As the questioner well knows, Baltimore is a big city in Maryland, which is a slave state before the Civil War. But Baltimore has a large free black population. Um, it's about 12,000 people in 1820, 1830. So anywhere there's a free black population, kidnappers hunt, kidnappers maraud. And so we're well aware of um, this same gang launching raids into Baltimore in the 1810s and early 1820s, and well aware of other gangs, which are unrelated to the gang I talk about in Stolen, doing the same thing for the next several decades. After Philadelphia, Baltimore is probably one of the you know, second tier target cities for kidnappers involved in America's reverse underground railroad. Uh, Marlo wants to know, um, how important is, in your opinion, is it for everyone to read this book, especially now that we're experiencing systemic racism. And he also wanted to know, um, how did John Brown have a role in stopping or speaking out against the reverse Underground Railroad? Yeah, um, let's take the, the last one some uh, first. Uh, I'm not okay. aware that 
um, John Brown makes that um, his number one uh, issue. John Brown had a lot of issues he cared about a lot. John Brown is definitely one of the good guys if you're looking for white folks uh, to be courageous and stand up in this story of the anti-slavery fight. But uh, he's focused on ending slavery here and now. And the raid on Harper's Ferry, as some of you may know, in 1859 is John Brown's attempt to get a thousand rifles into the, uh, no, it's a hundred thousand rifles into the arms of local enslaved people around Harper's Ferry to start a race war, right? To bring slavery to an end at the point of a gun. So he's focused on the big prize there, though he is of course thwarted in that. Um, Marlo, do I think people should read this book? You bet I do, you bet I do, though I'm obviously the author and super biased. But uh, as I hope you heard me uh, uh, say, I think the lessons of this book are several. And I think their connections and resonances with the world we live in now in the United States in 2020 and in Maryland in 2020 um, are, are loud and clear. Uh, I think this book is a reminder um, that the roots of our current and deep-seated racial problems uh, and racial tensions and racism and white supremacy go deep in Maryland's history, in the Chesapeake region's history, in America's history. They go back all the way to 1619, let's be clear um, about that. And my own country of origin, Britain, is deeply implicated and responsible for a lot of, um, of that story. Um, I also think that this book is chilling, actually, and it's a reminder that um, the freedom of African-American uh, people has often been under threat and fragile, um, even in free soil, even in the northern states, right? You can live legally free in Philadelphia, but still feel and fear that your freedom is going to be snatched away from you by a kidnapper at any time, that your loved ones, your children are going to be taken away from you and there's nothing uh, you can do, that the police in a northern city like Philadelphia are not your friends, that they unreliable um, allies, that the justice system is not looking out for you. I can see a clear resonance between that world um, and the world we live in now. And if I can make one related um, point here, it's that, um, you know, uh, kidnapping of free people, black or white, was illegal in every state of the Union in 1820. It was illegal in Massachusetts, illegal in Maryland, illegal in Mississippi, and yet it happened all the damn time. Slavery, um, illegal enslavement, uh, which we now call human trafficking, uh, went on on a massive scale. And that is still true today. I think too often we ignore the continuation of human trafficking in 2020. We think of slavery as an historical phenomenon only, something that we dealt with in the Civil War. But that's, of course, not true. In the same way that racism and white supremacy continue with us today, so too does slavery. It looks different now. It's entirely underground, wholly illegal. But modern human trafficking and modern slavery remain a scourge in Maryland, in Washington, D.C., in the United States, and around the world. Uh, 40 million people woke up in slavery this morning around the world. And in the United States, that number had six digits. It was at least 100,000 people woke up in illegal black market slavery, sex slavery, agricultural slavery, debt slavery, domestic slavery. We can't ignore this. We shouldn't ignore this. We all like to tell ourselves that if we'd been alive before the Civil War, we would have all been anti-slavery activists. Yet slavery is still with us now. And are we all doing enough to continue to fight that scourge today? The same goes for the anti-racist fight now, now right? We all tell ourselves we'll be on the right side of history a hundred years ago. Well, we get to choose now which side of history we want to be on. Um, so it, there's a lot of connections. I agree with the premise of your question. Thank you. Um, piggybacking on that, Angela wants to know, how does your research provide recommendations into prevention for the kidnapping of children today? What protections need to be implemented now for lasting change and protection of our children? Yeah, uh, I'm not well positioned to offer specific advice here, right? Because this is a historical project I've spent 10 years of my life with, um, but I'm not a social worker. I'm not a policy uh, maker. So I would not trust someone like me to make policy recommendations. That would be asking an amateur um, to do something which professionals should take very seriously. So I just hope that this sort of historical context comes to the attention of people who are social workers, who are policy makers at the state level uh, and federal 
uh, level. And if there's a, you know, a lesson um, uh, here, it's that the state could have played a much larger role in stopping this in 1825 than the role it actually did. The um, state of Pennsylvania lifts almost no fingers to help black parents. It's only because one particular mayor of Philadelphia um, gives a damn that anything changes, and even he is under tremendous pressure from three black parents to get him to get off his ass and do something, excuse my language. Um, so um, what black parents, I think, have always known, what free black communities have always known, is uh, that they're not always gonna have reliable uh, allies, unfortunately, in this country. And in my book, Stolen, it's amazing to see all the things they can accomplish without reliable white allies or people in positions of political power or legal power in the justice system. We see free black communities in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in the 1820s and 1830s, mobilized to do everything they can to deter and um, eviscerate kidnappers who come into their neighborhoods. They launch sort of neighborhood watch associations. They're really paramilitaries uh, designed to um, deter any kidnappers from walking down their streets, from coming anywhere near their kids. And on the rare occasions when those kidnappings happen in front of parents and neighbors and onlookers in a free black community, you can bet those people are gonna rush over and intervene. When we find kidnappings being stopped, it's not usually a white person stopping it. It's usually a member of the free black community uh, rightly taking justice into their own hands because no one else will. And I think we'll wrap up with this last question. Um, Erica wants to know, um, I know this is not the focus of the, of the book, but wondering if you know the answer, how long did, uh, oh, well, how long did this practice last? When did it end? And actually there was another question too from Brittany, was Annabellum 2020 similar to this story? So those are the two. Last yeah, comments and questions. What I think will, will for, force me to repeat some things I've already said. So I'm just going to uh, talk about the, um, um, uh, unless you're referring to the movie, which I've not seen, Antebellum. I have not mm -hmm. seen that. Okay. Uh, and, the, and the previous question was, how long did this go on? Well, mm -hmm. one answer to that is to say that things keep getting worse after 1825. Uh, kidnappings uh, of free black people in northern states continue. And then the federal government weighs in in 1850 with the Fugitive Slave Law, and not in a good way, not in a helpful way. Um, this is going to be too much inside baseball, so I'm going to keep this uh, very brief. Um, the Fugitive Slave Act is mostly designed to help um, enslave enslavers whose enslaved property have run away from them. The new law helps um, slave owners get those people back. But one of the side effects of that law is that it makes it very easy, much easier than before, for kidnappers to op operate publicly and to be confused in the eyes of the law with legal slave catchers. The law can't see the difference anymore between a legal slave catcher or a kidnapper of a free black person, which means that kidnappers have basically the blessing of the federal government to go about this even more openly and brazenly than they have before 1850. So I would say that we have every reason to think that kidnappings spike, increase after 1850, getting worse and worse until the Civil War um, throws everything up in the air. And the Civil War to end American slavery as a legal institution will, of course, um, dramatically squash demand for enslaved people and for kidnapped free people being sold as slaves. So everything changes after the Civil War, but as I've just reminded you, that doesn't mean that all human trafficking is forever. We're living through in 2020, unfortunately, a golden age of human trafficking. Um, it doesn't, it's not racialized in the same way um, in 2020. It has different racial and ethnic patterns, uh, but human trafficking unfortunately continues under the radar as a black market today. Awesome. Great. Um, well, this has been an enjoyable program, and um, I'm going to now turn it over to Jacqueline for any closing remarks that she may have. Sorry, I was on mute. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to thank Dr. Bell again for spending time with us and sharing his incredible work uh, with Stolen. I'd like to encourage all of you to please read the book. I actually listened to the audiobook in preparation for this, um, and it is truly riveting. Um, so thank you, Dr. Bell, for both your work and your time today. Uh, thank you to all of our 
uh, attendees. Um, and we hope to welcome all of you at, at a talk that we have soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.